Ladies and gentlemen, welcome <clears throat> to another class uh, on the birth of learning. Tonight, I would like to discuss the early Christian reception of cla the classics and of classical education more generally among the Latin fathers. That would be the Latin church fathers of the first several centuries of the Christian era. Um, and we're going to see that as a general kind of theme, we're going to see two things, really. On the one hand, there is uh, a similar acceptance of the ancient classical tradition that one finds among the Greeks in that uh, there is a clear understanding that classical education is not to be dispensed with entirely. It is to be taken over to the uh, degree that it is able to be uh, in, uh, in harmony with the Christian faith. And yet the second theme that we're going to see is that there is a general, um, perhaps more uh, apprehension about the classical inheritance than one finds among the Greeks, the Greek fathers. So we saw, for instance, last time in writers such as St. Basil the Great and, uh, and, in, and many others as well, St. John Damascus, that uh, classical learning is clearly a wonderful thing and it is something that to be very much uh, encouraged, but yet it just, there are certain things that need to be obviously um, you know, kept at a distance, weeded out. There are certain elements, polytheism, immorality, uh, and, and other things like that that must that cannot be taken over uncritically from the classical inheritance. Uh, but but everything that can be should be with gusto. Uh, we don't see that to the same degree of enthusiasm among the uh, Latin fathers. In fact, uh, we were going to see that, especially among certain writers such as Saint Jerome. There is altogether uh, uh, a lot of apprehension about the uh, about this the relationship that Christianity has with the classical tradition, um, and we will be spending a lot of time tonight talking about Saint Augustine, and he has a rather nuanced perspective in this regard as well. So, having laid out those kind of delineations, we're just going to kind of mention some initial facts. First of all. Starting really from the beginning, in the first century and uh, second century, when Christianity first begins to uh, appear in Rome, and of course we know that this was right in the apostolic period, Saint, one, of, uh, one of Saint Paul's letters in the New Testament is indeed to the Romans. We know that both he and Saint Peter were both martyred in Rome, so Christianity was in Rome from the earliest days of the apostles. And the Christians who were in Rome, many of them were, um, uh, to some degree, probably uh, schooled in the traditional Greco-Roman paideia. Uh, it is a mistake to think that all the converts to early Christianity were simply from the lowest orders of society, slaves and so on. That is certainly um, a common uh, thought that many people have, but it is certainly not true. Uh, there were, there is even some evidence uh, from the um, uh, from the uh, from the first century, that Christianity might have even um, made its way into certain members of the imperial household by the time you get to the reign of Domitian. So, um, there, uh, but nevertheless, to the degree that uh, that it was becoming more widespread in the first century, it was generally not among the lowest of the low, but a kind of the more perhaps middle stratum of society, and. Um, so therefore, the, the people who were converting to Christianity to the degree that they were educated in the traditional paideia would have, of course, had a long uh, uh, you know, um, formation in the classical Latin authors, uh, Virgil and Terence for poetry, Sallust and Livy for prose, but of course, the others as well. And of course, um, the language of early Christianity even in the West, in Rome, was still very much Greek. So, uh, so again, to the degree that people who converted to Christianity were educated in the classical paideia, they would have studied the Greek authors as well. Um, and this was the sort of general makeup of things for the first century and a half or so. But as the second century wore on, we start to see a uh, spreading of the church into the higher, more educated classes of the Roman Empire. And uh, that is a, pro a process that would go on to continue all the way through to the time of Constantine, when Christianity would become 
uh, the favored religion in Rome, not the official religion, but certainly the favored religion in Rome, it would not become the official religion until the 390s under the emperor um, uh, Theodosius. But nevertheless, throughout this time of the further expansion of the church into the educated classes, it was simply sort of taken for granted that uh, classical studies was that's what you studied in school. That's what. That's how you learned how to read and write. That's how you learned how to use your language, uh, and uh, that's you, you know you were acquainted with a large body of texts and philosophical ideas, historical uh, texts, and uh, your whole you know everything that we've been learning about your whole formation of tastes and of and of uh, aesthetic values, and even a good degree of morality is formed by uh, this sort of classical paideia. And new converts simply brought with them uh, that cultivation, that mental cultivation with them, and began to apply it uh, to an explication of their new faith. And so we have many apologies or many defenses of the faith that date from uh, starting from the, the second century uh, AD onwards, where we can see clearly philosophical ideas, philosophical forms of argumentation being utilized for the, uh, at the service of Christianity. Um, and now, it, there was a general idea that basically that's what education was, and it really nobody really could kind of think uh, of, a, of education apart from that in some sense. And Christianity, of course, we have to understand, was still very much a persecuted minority in these early centuries. And so um, the idea of kind of revolutionizing the whole uh, of Roman society and turning it into a Christian society really was not even an idea uh, that anyone really articulates until, say, you get until uh, the third century, when you start to begin to see something like that, as we looked at last time with, say, Clement of Alexandria, uh, and then Origen, this kind of the beginning of an idea of turning the whole of the society into a Christian one. It seems that in, in these earlier periods, these earlier centuries, uh, the idea was based basically to kind of, you know, just try to, to, to you know, have an existence, to, to, to win an existence for oneself within the, uh, within the hostile Roman world. Um, and a perfect example of the kind of thing that I'm talking about, of both of this, uh, of the further expansion of the church into the educated classes, and sort of an attempt to, to write an apology to win over tolerance by the larger pagan world, it is to be found in the writer Minutius Felix, who writes sometime in the middle of the, the third century. And uh, he's writing in Latin. He writes a Platonic slash Ciceronian style philosophical dialogue, which had been, of course, uh, grist for the mill, uh, that form that genre for many, many centuries at this point in the Greco-Roman uh, philosophical uh, literature. And in it, a pagan uh, is uh, talking with a Christian and they have a debate and there's a, there's a great deal of kind of civility and, and uh, respect for one another inside of this debate. It really tries to capture that sort of classical, humane uh, tone that one finds in, say, Cicero or Plato and uh, in their dialogues. And there is an attempt to try to win over the pagan to Christianity based on looking at exempla and ideas found among the classical authors, particularly the poets and uh, on the philosophers. And, and, this, and this happens at the end of the dialogue. The pagan is won over and is forced to kind of uh, confess that, uh, that Octavius, the Christian, is... Um, uh, you know, presents Christian truth in a way that not only is philosophically compelling, but also aesthetically pleasing. Um, there isn't a great deal of sophisticated theology in this dialogue, but nevertheless, you can kind of see that there is an attempt to, to work out to the greatest degree possible a harmony between the new faith and the ancient learning. Uh, and this is more generally to be seen uh, among, uh, among these early uh, Christian writers. Now, as I said before, Latin really is not uh, widely spread as a language for Christianity in these early centuries, even in Rome, even in elsewhere in, in the Western Roman Empire and places like Gaul, still Greek is very much to be uh, considered the, uh, the language of Christianity. The only place where you really see a lot of Latin Christianity is in North Africa. Minucius Felix is a North African writer, as is the person you see in front of you, Tertullian. Okay, now we talked about this last time. Uh, we talked about 
Tation last time is really what I mean. Tation, you recall, was the, basically the exception that proves the rule. We said in general, the Greek church fathers are very enthusiastic about looking at Greek learning and classical learning as being uh, copacetic with the, with the faith. Um, as long as you kind of have certain reservations about things that are obviously not copacetic, like, as we said, immorality and polytheism and so on. Um, but there's this one author, Tatian, who is vehemently against uh, any kind of anything to do with classical learning. He's very angry and his tone is, is very derisive. He, he, he comes across as being a person who has a lot of maybe personal issues, we might say, that, you know, that he, he converts to Christianity, but maybe he looks back at his pagan his years as a pagan with disgust and uh you know and uh associates anything from that past with with d just utter you know depravity and so therefore um he criticizes it doesn't see anything good at all anything to be redeemed in the pagan uh, inheritance of classical learning and he criticizes it very vociferously well the analogous personage, uh, personage in the West to Tatian in the East is Tertullian, okay? Now, Tertullian is a lot more intellectually um, interesting than Tatian on many levels. In fact, there's many writings that Tertullian has left us that are perfectly um, good and, and, and actually very, uh, very good. He's kind of sort of, uh, you know, has to be uh, considered in some ways a patristic writer. He is, he is certainly um, an authority when he's talking about certain things. But nevertheless, he, <clears throat> he suffers basically from the same sort of problem that Tatian suffers from, namely that in his, uh, you know, he converts late in life. He was a lawyer beforehand. And after he converts to Christianity, he basically looks back at his, you know, life with a lot of, uh, you know, kind of perhaps regret and, and sees that, you know, paganism and all of the pagan Roman world is just being utterly in darkness, and therefore it doesn't want to have anything to do with it, and, and is really, really um, critical of anything uh, having to do with that. So he, he, he actually would even encourage uh, people, uh, converts to Christianity, never to touch the classical authors whatsoever. He, um, uh, as we talked about in class also last time, he, he because of his training as a lawyer and as a rhetorician, he was very um, given to kind of going for rhetorical wins, even when it kind of came at the expense of theology. Uh, you know, so, for instance, he's most famously known for a couple of quotations, one of which is... Uh, Credo quia absurdum est, I believe, because it is absurd. And this is, uh, you know, he's, this is from his famous apologeticum, his apology, where he's trying to defend Christianity against a um, kind of a, a general pagan audience. And he says, you tell me that it's absurd, but I believe that the precepts that are the, the, the facts of, that, are, that are to be found in the gospel, a virgin giving birth, a, a man rising from the dead, you tell me this is absurd. Well, I believe it because it is absurd. You know, um, this is, you know, basically he's going for the rhetorical sort of punch. Uh, but it, it's it's an absurd statement, is what that is, because, <clears throat> uh, well, I mean, if, if if you were to force me to explain why that is absurd, I would say because. Uh, if God exists, then He is perfectly capable of performing miracles, and uh, there is actually uh, so much evidence to uh, corroborate the accounts of the of the resurrection in the Gospels. Um, not least of which is St. Paul's comment in 1 Corinthians that Christ, uh, once he was risen, appeared to over 500 people, uh, many of whom are still alive to this day, he says. Uh, this is not the sort of claim one can make when there's hundreds of people out there that could say that that wasn't true. Um, we could go into that more on some other time, I suppose. But the point is, is that uh, it is not absurd to believe in the virgin birth. It is not absurd to believe in the resurrection of Christ. These are historical realities that, um, that can be verified. Now, um, uh, another one of his famous uh, quips is, uh, is, and even more to the point, really, where he's talking about the relationship between Christianity and the, uh, and the classical inheritance, is he says, uh, what hath Athens to do with Jerusalem? And of course, what he means by that is, what does the Greek intellectual tradition, Athens, 
have to do with Christianity, Jerusalem. That's the idea. In other words, the prophets of the Old Testament spoke with a plain language. They weren't sitting there splitting hairs with logic and so on. And therefore, what does faith have to do with reason, we might say? Um, this is a question that, of course, would set the tone in many ways for medieval Christianity, not so much because it was, uh, not because Tertullian's negative appraisal of, the, of that question carried the day, it didn't, but rather because uh, there was this very, very genuine attempt to merge or marry faith and reason um, all throughout the scholastic period of, of the Middle Ages. But anyway, so that gives you the idea. Now, it is significant for me that the one person really that you get among the Greek fathers, Tatian, and the one person you really get among the Latin fathers, Tertullian, who both have this 100% negative appraisal of the classical tradition, both, decide, uh, both ended their lives outside of the church. Tatian uh, adopted a heresy known as encratitism, which is basically like this extreme form of Puritanism. Uh, and, and Tertullian was something rather similar to it. his heresy that he embraced at the end of his life was called Montanism, uh, which is essentially kind of like a ancient version of Quakerism in some ways. It, it called for the complete um, uh, it, well, it, it said that every person has their own revelations from God. There is no need for a priesthood or for the church, for that matter, or for anything external whatsoever, any sacraments or any, any, anything uh, in terms of liturgy or art or, uh, in a further sense, we might say culture. Um, and so, you know, and that perfectly really is, it seems to be of an organic whole with his negative appraisal of Greco-Roman culture. Uh, what you need, except to sit in a room quietly, uh, perhaps with a group of your other religious friends and, uh, and kind of, uh, you know, listen to the still small voice. Uh, that's all that's necessary. Um, and, uh, and so that's basically where Tertullian ended up. And it is significant for me, as I said, because both of these men um, get it wrong. The, the church never had this kind of um, rigorous attitude toward the classical inheritance, never once. And those who, who did have this kind of opinion wind up not being in the church anymore. Um, of course, that is not to say that you won't find members of the church who are anti-intellectuals, um, that is no doubt true, but nevertheless, it is not the church's position. Okay, that is not the way it works. Uh, and as we will see, and I hope to show you tonight, that even though there maybe is a greater reluctance on the part of the Latin fathers than there was on the part of the Greek fathers to embrace uh, the classical inheritance with more gusto, nevertheless, there always, even among the Latins, was still a great sense of appreciation for that classical inheritance and the, its importance in Christian culture and in cultivating the life of the mind. Um, and so such rigorous views were never really carried out, uh, certainly as uh, Tertullian's prohibition against Christians as teaching Latin, I was teaching classics, uh, this never was carried out at all. And we have many, many uh, Christian figures. Arnobius of Sica, who's again a North African Latin writer, um, and his student Lactantius, who actually wound up being a, 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 a tutor for the children of Constantine. Um, and uh, not to mention later writers like Prudentius and uh, many others um, who, uh, who all embrace rhetoric and the classical educational tradition and then go on to be professors of rhetoric and, um, and, uh, uh, and certainly uh, carry that tradition onwards in their, in their teaching uh, of young people. However, in the fourth century, after the, the, all the writers whom I've just mentioned, in the middle of the fourth century, there of course was a major kind of crisis point that came in the edict of the emperor Julian, that would be Julian the Apostate, who ruled from 361 to 363. And um, you recall that one of his edicts, well, he was, he, his whole big attempt was to try to turn back the clock on the Constantinian revolution, on the change of, uh, of the Roman the Roman Empire away from paganism towards Christianity. Constantine saw that that was going to be a process that would take time. You couldn't do it overnight. You needed to kind of bring people there in a way that they were. And you couldn't force people. You can never force anyone uh, to become a Christian. Okay, that is, that's not how it works. It would be like forcing a person to love somebody that they don't love. Um, the heart cannot be ever coerced. It must be persuaded. 
and um, and and inspired, but it can never be coerced. If uh, you know that is always wrong to try to make anyone do something that they don't want to do, uh, especially when it comes to these ultimate things. So, um, but nevertheless, jo Julian tried to turn back the clock on this process of of Christianization of the Roman Empire. And one of the big ways in which he wanted to do this was by issuing an edict that forbade any Christian from teaching pagan literature, from being a teacher. And um, he worded it in, in a very particularly way, very clever way. He said, uh, no, no teacher, because it is absolutely 100% necessary that every teacher be of the highest moral fiber, um, and to be of good moral fiber, you must believe what you teach, and you must, you can't be a liar, and therefore, um, no teacher of rhetoric can, is allowed to teach or of, rhetoric, of literature unless they believe in the ideas that are being taught inside of those texts. And so that meant that no Christian could teach the classics because it was all about, you know, it was all based on mythology. Um, and he obviously, Julian obviously understood that teachers, there is a way of reading the classics, of reading mythology and reading classical literature in a way that a Christian can take benefit from it and can enjoy it without having to believe in it. And just, and we, of course, take that for granted in our way. I mean, we've all read the Iliad and the Odyssey, and we, we've all grown up learning about the Greek myths, and I'm sure none of you ever uh, decided to worship Zeus or something like that. Uh, and um, and so it is possible to do that. And that this is, a, this very act of our, of the way that we look at this kind of reading is itself an inheritance of Christianity that we've taken over without even realizing it as we have so many things, but that's another issue. Um, and so anyway, there was this, after Julian died, he died um, in a very small little skirmish uh, fighting the Persians, um, and uh, his whole, whole army basically almost got wiped out, but they, they did make it back uh, to the Roman Empire. And um, after that, though, there was this real kind of question, you know, what is the relationship between Christianity and the classical inheritance, between classical literature and the Bible? How should a Christian read these texts, and to what degree can one uh, learn these things? And so, um, to answer that question, well, first of all, we, we, we read all about this. Uh, uh, this is a nice little quotation from St. Augustine in his Confessions, where he talks about one Marius Victorinus, who was a grammarian and Neoplatonic uh, influenced Christian, who was a teacher of classics, but who at the time of the edict published by Julian that prohibited Christians from teaching literature and oratory, uh, Marius Victorinus embraced that law. Uh, not the law of the Emperor Julian, but, um, uh, uh, well, so yes, he embraced that law, meaning that he was no longer going to teach because he was a Christian, and he preferred to desert the loquacious school rather than desert thy word, O Lord, by which you make the tongues of infants eloquent. A beautiful line from uh, St. Augustine. And so we know that there were plenty of teachers who who, um, who were teaching, Christian people who were teaching the classics at this time. Um, and uh, we see a perfect kind of embodiment of this of this question of to what degree should a class, uh, should a christian be enthusiastic about in their embracing of the classical tradition is saint jerome so saint jerome was a very learned person he was one of the few church fathers to learn hebrew actually and uh, he translated the bible into latin into an updated uh, smooth and beautiful latin that is um that was this the standard one that uh, that, that became the standard one in the west now it, it, it was he translated it into Latin because that was the commonly understood tongue at the time in the West. And this is where you really begin to see a large expansion of Latin in Christianity, or eclipsing Greek in the West. Um, uh, and, uh, and so because of this kind of um, taking, the, taking the scriptures and putting them in the tongue that everybody would understand, it became known as the Biblia Sacra Vulgata, that is the sacred Bible made in the common tongue. Uh, with great irony, that uh, that language of Latin, the, this is of course the Vulgate, that's where the word Vulgate comes from. His Vulgate translation um, would become the standard one for the next, uh, well, really until now. 
Um, but with great irony, because, of course, Latin became the reserve for only the educated few, ultimately, in the West, and the, uh, not, the, not the language that everybody spoke anymore. So um, there's a great irony there. Uh, but inside of the sacred scriptures, though, St. Jerome in his epistle uh, 30 says that he found another chorus, another catullus, and another alces. These are, of course, all ancient Greek and Latin poets. And uh, in other words, the sacred scriptures fulfill for me the need for any kind of uh, reading of profane literature. Um, and we see again in another one of his uh, letters, I'm sorry, no, one of his uh, writings against one Rufinus, St. Jerome declares that he has not read the secular authors, the profane authors, as they would be called, uh, since he left school, quote, though I admit I read them a while there. Must I drink then the waters of Lethe that I may forget? And that is a very kind of funny uh, way of putting it because without even perhaps, uh, I'm sure he realized what he was doing, but in defending himself, the first figure that occurs to him is itself a, uh, a reference to classical mythology, the waters of Lethe, uh, that Lethe is the river of forgetfulness that souls drink from in the underworld before they are reincarnated and therefore forget everything that they had learned before. Um, and, but yet on another occasion, um, St. Jerome finds fault with clergymen who find too keen a pleasure in the reading of Virgil. Um, uh, you know, that this is not something that uh, a clergyman should be spending too much time doing, he says. But he nevertheless adds that youths uh, are indeed compelled to study him because this is the classical model of education that basically was taken for granted. Okay. Now, um, most famously, in regards to the relationship of Christian piety and classical learning, uh, and the tension that is there, St. Jerome relates a vision that he had in his Epistle 21, which we're going to read just a bit of right now. I'm sorry, that should be Epistle 22. He says the following, many years ago, when for the kingdom of heaven's sake, I had cut myself off from home, parents, sister, relations, and harder still from the dainty food to which I had been accustomed. And when I was on my way to Jerusalem to wage my warfare, meaning to live as a monk in the desert, I still could not bring myself to forego the library which I had formed for myself at Rome with great care and toil. And so miserable man that I was, I would fast only that I might afterwards read Cicero. After many nights spent in vigil, after floods of tears called from my inmost heart, after the recollection of my past sins, I would once more take up Plautus, a Roman playwright, a comic. Uh, and when at times I returned to my right mind and began to read the prophets, their style seemed rude and repellent. I failed to see the light with my blinded eyes, but I attributed the fault not to them, but to the sun. While the old serpent was thus making me his plaything, about the middle of Lent a deep-seated fever fell upon my weakened body, and while it destroyed my rest completely, the story seems hardly credible, it so wasted my happy, unhappy frame that scarcely anything was left of me but skin and bone. Meanwhile, preparations for my funeral went on. My body grew gradually colder, and the warmth of life lingered only in my throbbing breast. Suddenly I was caught up in the spirit and dragged before the judgment seat of the judge, and here the light was so bright and those who stood around were so radiant that I cast myself upon the ground and did not dare to look up. I asked who and what I was. I replied, I am a Christian, but he who presided said, Thou liest, thou art a follower of Cicero and not of Christ. In the Latin, this is even more terse. It says, non Christianus said tu Ciceronianus says. You are a Ciceronian, not a Christian. For where thy treasure is, there will thy heart be also. Instantly I became dumb, and amid the strokes of the lash, for he had ordered me to be scourged, I was tortured more severely still by the fire of conscience, considering with myself that verse, in the grave who shall give thee thanks. Yet, for all that I began to cry and to bewail myself, saying, Have mercy upon me, O Lord, have mercy upon me. Amid the sound of the scourges, this cry still made itself heard. At last, the bystanders, falling down before 
um, uh, the knees of him who presided, prayed that he would have pity on my youth and that he would give me space to repent of my error. He might still, they urged, inflict torture on me should I ever again read the works of the Gentiles. Under the stress of that awful moment, I should have been ready to make even still larger promises than these. Accordingly, I made oath and called upon his name, saying, Lord, if ever again I possess worldly books, or if ever again I read such, I have denied thee. Dismissed then on taking this oath, I returned to the upper world, and to the surprise of all, I opened upon them eyes so drenched with tears that my distress served to convince even the, the incredulous, and that this was no sleep nor idle dream, such as those by which we are often mocked, I call to witness the tribunal before which I lay, and the terrible judgment which I feared. May it never hereafter be my lot to fall under such an inquisition. I profess that my shoulders were black and blue, that I felt the bruises long after I awoke from my sleep, and that henceforth I read the books of God with a zeal greater than I had previously given to the books of men. Okay, so this is a very famous passage, Okay, and it is, um, uh, you can actually see if you go to the Cloisters Museum here in New York, um, there is a beautiful illustrated uh, manuscript from the medieval period um, with this letter, uh, it's, it's in the case, but it's open to this letter. You can actually see it. Now, what do we do with this? Uh, how are we to understand this? Because it seems, and it, indeed it has been interpreted to mean basically an all outright condemnation of everything from the, you know, that, that, in, that a Christian should not read the classical authors at all. I don't think we, are, should, we should understand it in this regard. We, we have to kind of keep it in context. First of all, we can see here uh, we, we see that Jerome is a, is a monk, okay? He's living a life in the desert. I actually was in, uh, in Bethlehem where, he, where his cell was, and uh, it's still there. You can still go and visit it. Um, it's part of the Church of the Nativity. Um, well, it's part, nearby the Church of the Nativity. And um, he is a monk, uh, and his, his main job, therefore, is fasting, prayer, vigil, uh, to combine that with a, with a too great love of any kind of anything else. And it could be, uh, you know, I don't know, stamp collecting or something like that would always be a violation of, of one's monastic um, calling to get too involved in anything that doesn't have a kind of a, of a direct relationship with one's spiritual life. So not to say that monks cannot have uh, you know, things that they like to do that are, you know, perhaps less direct, um, but, uh, you know, in terms of their spirituality, such as gardening or painting or paint of poetry writing or whatever the case may be. But when, a, you know, it is possible to develop a, a passion, a sinful passion for anything almost. And therefore, that's really what I think we're meant to understand here is clearly he is, uh, you know, the problem is that he had an unhealthy attachment uh, to an, an, un an unhealthy zeal for classical literature, and it was taking him aw away from his relationship with God. I think that really is how we have to understand this more. Um, and um, this is, I think, proven by other quotations from him, from his corpus, um, where we see both him and St. Augustine, too, who we're going to, as I said, we're going to devote the whole the majority of our lecture tonight to him, actually, I'm kind of uh, held off talking too much about him so far for a reason. Um, but, you know, St. Jerome in other places basically seems not so much to be interested in a separation, but rather uh, a, a proper combination of the treasures of classical literature and of Christian truth. For instance, St. Jerome recalls in his epistle 83, a precept from Deuteronomy, if you desire to marry a captive, you must first shave her head and eyebrows, shave the hair on her body and cut her nails. And he says, so must it be done with profane literature. After having removed all that was earthly and idolatrous, unite with her and make her fruitful to the Lord. So that sounds very much like what the Greek fathers have, were saying, remember from last time. Um, you know, that you don't want to just be, you know, you, you can't be indiscriminate about one's learning, you know, and this is, of course, um, something that you hear so much of in, in modern day educational 
theory, uh, forget about even in terms of its relationship with Christianity, we're not even going there, but just, you know, the, the, the idea that, you know, as long as they're reading, you know, kids basically can't do any, anything wrong. As, you know, as long as we're getting the kids to somehow read anything, then it's a, a good thing, even if it's stuff that's really just, uh, I mean, outrageous. Uh, you know, I know from my own experience as a teacher, an English teacher in the New York City public schools for 20 years, the kind of stuff that is being, you know, young adult literature is just a wasteland. Um, you know, uh, there was this book that I, uh, I, I, I saw it sitting, on, we share our rooms with other teachers, and there was another, there was a book sitting there called The, the Perks of Being a Wallflower. I don't know if you've ever had the misfortune of reading this book i even made a movie about it from my understand but one of my students though said to me oh you see that book there open up to page you know 23 or whatever it was and i opened it up and it was like softcore porn you know it was like a like a very like you know very salacious and sordid uh description of of sex acts by you know a teenager at a party and um you know the, the, and the, the ideology behind this so far as i could tell is you know is you know to get kids interested in reading or something like that so that they can you know that they'll read because anything that's not salacious and sordid and disgusting is not going to intrigue people and i i find that to be idiotic as a rationale but anyway the point though is that uh the the classical christian understanding of these things would obviously say no that is not the way it's supposed to be um and and my experience has actually led me to believe that to be the case as well uh you know students do really respond well when they read the iliad and the odyssey and the oristia and sophocles and Plato and everything else, that there is intrinsic value to things. You don't need to go down to the level of, you know, of passions uh, just to get pe to pique people's interests. Uh, you can elevate them. And that's really the, the major difference uh, is getting people to be elevated and ennobled as opposed to just catering to their passions. But I digress. Um, this trepidation on the part of many prominent Latin church fathers is, is interesting if we contrast it with the ease and liberality, the latitudinarianism, one might even say, of, say, St. Ambrose of Milan, who was also active during the fourth century, as you can see from his date, 337 to 397, he was active right in the middle, right, you know, in that time after um, uh, Julian was, uh, you know, Emperor Julian was, was active, uh, you know, with his edicts and so on. Now, St. Ambrose is one of the last Latin bishops to be educated both in the traditional Greek paideia and, of course, Latin literature as well. He is a Latin father. He he wrote and preached in Latin, and he wrote tons of works, many, many hymns, which are still used, the Te Deum. If you're familiar with that hymn, that is one of his. And um, he has no uh, doubts or fears whatsoever as to touching as touching upon the value of the classical humanities. He all of, throughout his writings, he's he quotes freely from a whole range of classical authors: Seneca, Virgil, uh, the Constellation of Servius Sulpicius, Homer, Plato, even the uh, Epic, even the founder of Epicureanism, Epicurus himself. Epicurus, of course, uh, Ep and Epicureanism was much maligned in antiquity. Basically, everybody hated the Epicureans, except for other Epicureans. Um, you know, the Stoic philosophers, even before Christianity, were always mocking them and putting them down and kind of just calling them a bunch of hedonists and stuff. Uh, but St. Saint Saint Ambrose is perfectly capable of, of taking tidbits from Epicurus, reworking them sometimes. I think particularly of, of a very famous line, Epicurus, famously says, death is nothing to this, do it to us. Hothanatos uden prosemas, death is nothing to us, because while we are here, it is not there. While we are alive, that is, death is not here. And while we are dead, we feel nothing. And that which feels nothing is nothing to us. That's what, that which lacks sensation is nothing to us. Well, um, it's, it's very much an idea like, you know, you're, you don't have an immortal soul. And so if you're alive, then don't worry about death. And once you're dead, you won't be around to think about it anymore. That's basically the idea. It's very much like a kind of modern American way of looking at things, unfortunately. Very anti-Christian. But what uh, St. Ambrose does is, is kind of wonderful little kind of inversion of this. He takes this same idea. He goes, death is nothing to us, Christians. because when the soul, uh, when the body dies, the soul is released. The body no longer feels anything. 
and the soul is released unto the eternal delights of heaven. And that which doesn't feel anything is nothing to us. I mean, the dead body is no longer any, any concern of ours. You see, so it's kind of like he takes this idea of Epicurus and he sort of tweaks it and makes it into a Christian idea. And he certainly accepts the earlier view handed down from the apologists of previous generations like St. Justin, the philosopher who we studied last time, that ultimately all truth is Christian truth and that everything good found in the literature of the ancients ultimately comes from God. Okay, And he takes many exempl exemplar from the classical poets and uses them in a distinctly Christian way. I just gave you the example of Epicurus. I can think of another one. He, In one of his sermons, he has a beautiful part where he summon, summons up the image of Odysseus uh, when he wanted to hear the sirens, but without dying. You remember the sirens are these women who are kind of monsters, really, but they sing on uh, the cliffs and they sing this enchanting song that draws men to turn their boats towards them, but they are dashed upon the rocks and die. Um, and Odysseus gets around this by tying himself to the mast or having his men tie him to the mast and then they stop up their ears with wax and they are able to row by and so he gets to hear the uh the song of the sirens but not fall prey to it well uh saint ambrose literally says we must be like odysseus who tied himself to the mast so that when we are faced with temptations and we we do not rely upon our own strength but we cling all the more tenaciously to the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the wood that gives us life. And this is our strength in our time of trouble. Um, he's a wonderful writer, and I encourage you all to read St. Ambrose uh, uh, with, uh, with relish and profit. Um, nevertheless, in all whatever kind of point on the spectrum you want to look at of people being kind of enthusiastically uh, for classical education, being people kind of more guarded in their appreciation of it or whatever. Nevertheless, in all of this, it was universally presupposed that pagan studies were always going to be subordinate to Christian truth um, and that studying of sacred scripture and theology always had to come as being kind of the, uh, uh, th that was always the the main event, okay, that was always going to be the main uh, criterion of all other things. So if there's anything that's ever in conflict with that, then it, then it has to go. Um, uh, but to the degree that anything could be supportive of that, uh, certainly eloquence, studying classical literature, studying, studying classical philosophy, all of those things um, <clears throat> can can be uh, can be learned and be appropriated with a uh, you know with great enthusiasm. Okay, Saint Jerome again in one of his letters, Epistle eighty five, uh, writes to a professor of, of oratory at Rome, recommending the use of classical authors. He he calls classical literature a captive. And um, it's that it's that passage that we looked at before with the uh, you just must strip her of her uh, of, of the, you know, the, you know, these external things um, that are, uh, you know, the, the, you must strip classical literature of these external things that are unbecoming to Christian uh, piety. OK, now, having said all of that, I would now like to turn with. Uh, for the rest of our time together, which was which is going to be substantial for the next several hours, and um, I want to talk about. Um, oh, I'm sorry. There is actually one more thing I, we need to talk about. Um, in this regard, in in regard to again Saint Jerome, and in terms of the uh, usefulness or the kind of appropriation of the classical educational model, one of his letters, Epistle 107, is really one of the most eloquent articulations of the fusion of classical education and Christian piety in late antiquity. Uh, in particular, I, I want you to remember as much as you can our discussion of Quintilian, okay, who remember in all those early books of his work, uh, De Institutio um, Oratoria, I'm sorry, Institutio Oratoria, um, he, he lays out what parents should do from the earliest points in a child's life to get that child to be educated, how making blocks with the letters on them and, and playing games and so on, using stencils to learn how to write and 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 so that and having good models of speech around the child so that uh, so the child doesn't pick up anything like slang or you know curse words or anything like that. 
listen to keep all of that in mind as we read just a few just a few bits it's a very very long letter um but just a few bits from one uh, epistle 107 of saint jerome this is talking about a young girl he's writing to the mother saying this is how you should raise your daughter and how you should try to educate her get for her a set of letters made of boxwood or of ivory and called each by its proper name let her play with these so that even her play may teach her something and not only make her grasp the right order of the letters and see that she forms their names into a rhyme, but constantly disarrange their order and put the last letters in the middle and the middle ones at the beginning that she may know them all by sight as well as by sound. Moreover, so soon as she begins to use the style, that is the stylus, <clears throat> the ancient pen, upon the wax and her hand is still faltering either guide her soft fingers by laying your hand upon hers or else have simple copies cut upon a tablet so that her efforts confined within these limits may keep to the lines traced out for fear and not uh, stray outside of these offer prizes for good spelling and draw her onwards with little gifts such as children of her age delight in and let her have companions in her lessons to excite emulation in her remember quintilian says exactly the same thing that she may be stimulated when she sees them praised you must not scold her if she is slow to learn but must employ praise to excite her mind Right, don't yell at them all the time. Don't you don't don't punish the kids for getting something wrong, so that she may be glad when she excels others and sorry when she is excelled by them. Above all, you must take care not to make her lessons distasteful to her, lest a dislike for them conceived in childhood may continue into her maturer years. The very words which she tries bit by bit to put together and to pronounce ought not to be chance ones, but names specifically fixed upon and heaped together for the purpose. Those, for example, of the prophets or the apostles or the list of patriarchs from Adam downwards, as it is given by Matthew and Luke. In this way, while her tongue will be well trained, her memory will be likewise developed. Again, you must choose for her a master of approved years, life, and learning. A man of culture will not, I think, blush to do for a kinswoman or a highborn virgin what Aristotle did for Philip's son. Of course, that is Alexander the Great. When descending to the level of an usher, he consented to teach him his letters. Things must not be despised as of small account in the absence of which great results cannot be achieved. The very rudiments and first beginnings of knowledge sound differently in the mouth of an educated man and of an uneducated. Accordingly, you must see that the child is not led away by the silly coaxing of women to form a habit of shortening long words or of decking herself with gold and purple. All of these habits um, will spoil her conversation uh, and, the, and the other her character. She must not therefore learn as a child what afterwards she will have to unlearn. The eloquence of the Gracchi is said to have been largely due to the way in which from their earliest years their mother spoke to them. Hortensius became an orator while still on his father's lap. Early impressions are hard to eradicate from the mind. When once wool has been dyed purple, who can restore it to its previous whiteness? An unused jar long retains the taste and smell of that with which it is first filled. Grecian history tells us that the imperious Alexander, who was lord of the whole world, could not rid himself of the tricks of manner and gait which in his childhood he had caught from his governor, Leonides. We are always ready to imitate what is evil and faults are quickly copied where virtues appear unattainable. So uh, Quintilian says almost word for word, almost everything that is said here. Notice though there is this fusion of Christianity though with it. It's not, you get this idea specifically in terms of, first of all, it is a girl that he's talking about. Uh, that is significant to me. Remember in Quintilian, it was only a boy. Uh, his, when he talks about his model, um, you know, the, 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 from the child's birth until death, basically, uh, you know, the whole education of a person throughout their whole lifetime. He always has a male in front of his mind as a model. Um, Christianity, despite whatever uh, you have heard in, in the shrill and historically ignorant um, culture that we live in, was not a force for uh, repressing women. Uh, in fact, 
Christianity did much, much more for the liberation of women in the history of the West than any other force um, uh, before or, or subsequent to it. Um, and uh, indeed, this can be seen by the fact that just by comparing current modern day uh, uh, conditions for women in the West compared to those in, in the non-Western world. Um, it's much easier to be a woman in Europe or America or Australia than it is to be in the Middle East or Africa or indeed East Asia. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, in terms of rights and uh, access to education and, and uh, you know, all the rest of it. So, uh, and there's a reason for that. And it has, has everything to do with Christianity. We can see that here. So St. Jerome is, is clearly... Uh, uh, taking for granted that girls are just as uh, capable of learning as boys are. And he puts all the ideas that Quintilian is um, uh, put into his work and is kind of, you know, summarizing them here, sometimes almost quoting verbatim. But also what we see is, is there is, you know, there is a Christian uh, fusion here, though. So he says specifically, don't go in, don't get her around people that are going to be teaching her to you know, uh, put on tons of gold and makeup and, and uh, you know, to spoil her, her character. Um, but, you know, get people to speak properly to, that, to her, around her, get her to, to love learning and not be uh, punished severely, uh, you know, get her to, um, you know, to try to be, keep her free from any corrupting influences, because we are always ready to imitate what is evil. That is a distinctly Christian concept. Okay, that is not something that you see inside of the classical tradition. Okay, uh, yes, maybe the second part is a little bit, you know, faults, you know, to talk about faults uh, that we copy from other people. Um, you know, that that sort of language might be more typical in the uh, in the classical inheritance, but to talk about evil, that is uh, evil is a category that doesn't really exist in classical literature. It's, a, it's an idea that comes from the Bible. OK, it's an idea that comes from Christianity. Um, you know, in fact, Nietzsche has a, has a whole part in one of his books. Uh, it's called The Genealogy of Morals, where he talks about this, how in the classical inheritance, there really wasn't any concept of evil. Okay, there was good, but good oftentimes had an aristocratic sort of meaning to it, especially in Greek. Um, but evil, uh, no, there was there was base, there was shameful, there was, you know, conduct that was disgraceful and stuff. But evil as a concept is not really is to be found inside of uh, the classical inheritance. It is something that comes from Christianity. Okay, and of course it is real. Uh, you know, in fact, as G.K. Chesterton one time famously said, uh, of all the church's doctrines, the doctrine of original sin is perhaps the easiest to believe because it is uh, evidence for it is surrounding us every second of the day. The whole world lieth in evil. Anyway, so but this idea that human nature. Yes, it has tremendous capacity for good things if it is given the right kind of guidance and given the right sort of um, direction. But if you leave human nature by itself just simply to grow and to take on its own, you know, find its own path, it's always going to be a bad thing. It's always going to be, uh, you know, it's always going to lead to bad, okay? Human, it's, it's, the, it's the complete opposite of the idea that will come later on starting in the age of enlightenment in the 1700s and still very much with us to this day that basically the human beings are born good but somehow you know society makes them bad uh this is an idea that rousseau famously uh popularized we'll talk all about it when we get to our last lectures for this course but the classical christian understanding is no is that education is there to correct the faults of fallen human nature, nature that if left by itself would just run wild, uh, that the whole educative mission is to humanize and to make better, to make into a saint in the Christian understanding. Um, uh, what would otherwise be brute, unredeemed human nature? Okay. Now, as I said before, uh, what I would like to do is now turn our attention uh, to St. Augustine. This is no small task, because if one were to make a short list of those who have had the greatest influence on education in the Greco-Roman and Christian traditions, undoubtedly St. Augustine's name would be near the top. 
Setting aside Plato and Aristotle, few others have made such a profound and enduring impression upon the theory and practice of education in the West prior to the 20th century. Augustine was the first Christian to offer a detailed account of the liberal arts and their proper place in a liberal education. And much of what we take to be the traditional understanding of classical education is due at least in part to his early synthesis. Indeed, the general plan of studies, beginning with the liberal arts and proceeding to the various disciplines and ultimately uh, to philosophy and theology was championed by St. Augustine and handed down through the Middle Ages to the modern period. And this plan of studies was the nearly universal standard for education in the West well into the 20th century. And so it behooves us to spend a good deal of time upon him. Now, I want to begin with sort of a biographical sketch, which is difficult for him. Um, uh, it, well, I should say it's daunting, really, is the, is the term I guess I'm looking for. Uh, often the difficulty of giving a biographical sketch of any ancient figure arises from the meager knowledge we have of that person's biographical details. But with St. Augustine of Hippo, whose dates are 354 to 430 AD, the opposite is the case. In fact, I would even make the claim that of all authors from antiquity, we know more about the life of Augustine than perhaps that of any other figure. First, of course, we possess his book, The Confessions, which is a masterpiece of Western literature, one of the books you should all read at some point in your life, and in which Augustine gives an account of his own life from the beginnings, from the first beginnings, the primordia, up until the time of his conversion in 387. Then we also have the life of St. Augustine, penned by Pasidius of Kalama, uh, a close friend and fellow bishop who wrote the text to inform his readers of Augustine's later life as a priest and bishop. While Pasidius's Vita is an affectionate portrait, really, of a friend and mentor, it also provides a detailed account of Augustine's public life from his conversion to his death in 430. And finally, in addition to both his confessions and to the Vita, we possess a staggeringly large uh, treasury of Augustine's writings uh, from his early philosophical dialogues, such as Against the Academic Skeptics and On the Happy Life, to weighty treatises uh, <coughs> such as The City of God and On the Trinity. Also, we have biblical commentaries. Uh, such as his multiple works on the book of Genesis and his E Narraciones, or Expositions of the Psalms. We have his polemical writings, such as on baptism, which was a, a reply to a group of schismatics known as the Donatists, and on nature and grace, which was a response to the heretics known as the Pelagians. And we have nearly 300 uh, letters and 400 sermons, including those delivered as serial commentaries on biblical works. Altogether, Augustine's literary corpus runs to over five and, and a half million words. And what is more, even today, the, ex, the extant body of his writings continues to grow. Uh, there still are occasionally letters turning up from some manuscript that um, nobody knew existed or through infrared technology we can find through what are called palimpsests, works that were erased, and then some new text was written over. We can actually read what was there uh, before the erasure. And uh, new, new letters of his, new sermons of his are, are showing up every couple of years. Clearly, then, we suffer from no lack of material. Uh, and in light of this embarrassment of riches, the principal task of any person who's going to try to give a brief biographical sketch, such as I'm planning to do right now, um, clearly comes down on deciding what to leave out. So what I'm about to give in the outline of, uh, is really the major stages of Augustine's life. And I'm going to highlight the most salient features of his moral and intellectual development insofar as they shed light on his mature philosophy and theology of education, okay? Because that's really the focus of what we're talking here. Aurelius Augustinus was born on November 13th, 354, in the small municipality of Tagaste, which is in uh, modern-day Algeria. Uh, in ancient times, this was Numidia, uh, one of seven Roman provinces in Africa. At the time of Augustine's birth, his mother Monica was a uh, devout Christian. His father Patricius was a worldly and ambitious pagan. 
In the desires and aspirations of his parents, we can see in microcosm the tension that existed in the Roman world of late antiquity, a tension between the centuries old Roman way of life with its civic religion and the relatively new Christian faith that transcended the limits of space and time and which required allegiance to a king and kingdom not of this world. Patricius was a curialis, a minor city official who came from a traditional Roman family committed to traditional Roman ways. Though Augustine is discreet in speaking about this matter, it is clear that Patricius was not faithful to his long-suffering wife. Nor in these years was Patricius at all interested in her religion, which he likely perceived to be an innovative superstition at odds with traditional Roman religion. Uh, for her part, Monica did her best to commend her Christian faith to Augustine, albeit with fairly minimal success in his early years. At his birth, Augustine was signed with the cross and given his salt, ritualistic signs of being initiated into the catechumenate of the church. Even so, during his childhood, when Augustine was, quote, seized by stomach pains and came near to death, end quote, Monica decided not to have Augustine baptized uh, once he made a rapid recovery. As Augustine tells the story of his childhood, reading the character of his parents, there are images, however imperfect, of, these, of the two cities that he would see operative in the world, his mother representing the city of God and his father, the earthly city. Augustine's parents made significant sacrifices to obtain the best education they could afford for their son. And central to this education was the study of rhetoric, oratory, as we know. In the Roman world at this time, becoming a master of rhetoric was the most reliable route to social and political advancement. From 365 to 369, Augustine spent his first years away from home in Madaura, which is also in modern day Algeria, uh, studying grammar, by which we, we understand Latin literature. And after this, Augustine returned home for a year to save up money for additional education. He then traveled to Carthage, where he studied rhetoric from 370 to 373. And although not always the model student, Augustine excelled in his studies, eventually receiving an invitation to serve as the imperial rhetor in Milan, the capital of the Western Roman Empire at this time. During the customary course of study in the art of rhetoric, Augustine came across Cicero's Hortensius, an exhortation to the philosophical way of life. The text no longer exists, sadly enough. Augustine describes his encounter with Hortensius as bringing about a conversion of mind and of heart. He says, the book changed my way of feeling and the character of my prayers to you, O Lord, for under its influence, my petitions and desires altered. All my hollow hopes, that is for worldly advancement, seemed worthless. And with unbelievable intensity, my heart burned with longing for the immortality that wisdom seemed to promise. I began to rise up in order to return to you. Significantly, reading this text initiated a turning of Augustine's mind to the pursuit of wisdom and a turning of his heart to ever higher objects of love. For Augustine, the pursuit of wisdom, uh, at least in part to reorder one's desires, uh, I'm sorry, pursuit of wisdom is, is able, at least in part, to order one's desires. As one grows in knowledge of the truth, one comes to love those things that are most inherently worthy of love. And as his allusion to the parable of the prodigal son indicates, the ultimate object of Augustine's love becomes God, who subsists in it, eternally in a trinity of persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Another important effect of Augustine's reading the Hortensius of Cicero uh, was a growing awareness that education must be ordered to more than simply eloquence. He says, my interest in the book was not aroused by its usefulness in the honing of verbal skills, which was supposed to be the object of the studies I was now pursuing. No, it was not merely as an instrument for sharpening my tongue that I used that book, 
for it had won me over not by its style, by, but by what it had to say. The relationship of wisdom and eloquence and their place in education would become central themes in Augustine write, Augustine's writings. His reading of Hortensius also gave rise to Augustine's resolve to make the, the pursuit of truth a way of life. He says, I was aroused and kindled and set on fire to love and seek and capture and hold fast and strongly cling not to this or that school, but to wisdom itself, whatever it might be. Armed with this resolve, Augustine turned first to the Christian scriptures. However, regrettably, he was still too filled with intellectual pride to acknowledge the truth when it was not accompanied by eloquence. He says, when I studied the Bible and compared it with Cicero's dignified prose, it seemed to me unworthy. Unwilling to accept the unadorned truth of scripture, Augustine was quickly ensnared by a then popular Gnostic religion of Manichaeanism. Uh, and he will, we will see he will remain a man, he will enter into this religion and for over a decade. Named after its founder, Mani, a Persian mystic who lived from roughly 215 to 276, Manichaeism taught that there are two fundamental principles of reality. One, the supremely good, the summum bonum, and the other, the supremely evil, summum malum. When these deities came into conflict with one another, they became intermingled, which resulted in the visible material world coming into being. The world as we now experience it, Manichees argued, is a mixture of irreconcilable opposites. Light and darkness, good and evil, spirit and matter, male and female. Since neither the good principle nor the evil principle can overcome its opponent, there is an inevitable dualism in the cosmos. Thus the average person cannot hope to live free from the never-ending war between good and evil. Only a select few, those privy to the secret knowledge passed down through the teachings of Mani, could be delivered from this dualistic dilemma. Adherents of Manichaean religion were divided into, quote, the elect and, quote, the hearers. The first were those who could liberate the good deity from its bondage within material objects. Since sexual intercourse necessarily involves the body, the elect refrained from sexual relations so as not to perpetuate the entrapment of the good spirit in matter, uh, that is, in material bodies, which are by nature evil. This inf the inferior class of hearers, auditors, they're sometimes called, performed a daily routine of prayers and served this elite class in various ways, such as providing them with fruits and vegetables to chew in order to release the principle of good from its incarnation in matter. <laughs> Significantly, the Manichaeans presented their religion as a purified form of Christianity, a religion within the limits of reason alone. They ridiculed uh, traditional Christian belief and openly attacked the Old Testament on the ground. Old Testament on the grounds that its depiction of God was anthropomorphic and its morality barbaric. Augustine was a hearer among the Manichaeans for nine years. What appealed to him in this strange Gnostic sect was the fact that, first of all, it offered a rational response to the problem of evil, a problem that deeply troubled Augustine prior to his conversion to Christianity. Unde malum, where does evil come from, he would say, he would ask. Living during the eclipse of the Western Roman Empire, Augustine witnessed firsthand abundant evidence of evil and suffering in the world. If there is a God and he knows about evil and has the power to prevent it, why doesn't he do so? A philosopher might formulate the question the following way. Given the existence of an omniscient, omnipotent God, unde malum, whence comes evil? Well, the Manichaean response to the problem of evil was simply to deny God's omnipotence. This response solves, in quotation marks, the problem in a rational way, even if it does so at the expense of God's ability to administer justice. Even more appealing to Augustine was the way that Manichaeanism removed moral responsibility for one's own actions. Clearly, if there are two irreconcilable principles at war in every human heart, man cannot be held responsible for what he does. 
Because among his other moral failings, Augustine tells us that he struggled for years with sexual sin. During his period of study in Carthage, from 370 to 373, Augustine met a woman and had intimate relations with her uh, as a con uh, she became his concubine for many years. That's not a term that we use so much anymore, but it is totally indistinguishable from having a live-in girlfriend. Uh, it, you know, when one goes to a cocktail party nowadays, usually you don't meet people who introduce you to their concubine, but it is in no way different, really, from having, you know, from cohabitation without being married. Well, one result of this union was the birth of Augustine's son, uh, whom he named Adeodatus, given by God, which is a beautiful name. And it shows that even before he became a Christian, Augustine was clearly thinking a lot about God. Well, although the Manichaean elect were required to take a vow of celibacy, no such burden was placed upon the hearers. And given the no-fault uh, theology championed by the Manichaean religion, Augustine was content to allow this and other sins, especially intellectual pride, to fester within himself. Eventually, however, Augustine became disillusioned with Manichaeism. For all his acknowledged faults during this period of his life, Augustine never lost his passion for truth. In fact, one of the initial reasons Augustine had thrown in his lot with the Manichees was that they claimed to adhere to a thoroughly rational religion, one involving no appeal to faith or authority or even anything beyond what a reasonable person could readily accept. Alongside a creed based on a purged version of Christianity, Manichees claimed to have an entire cosmology that coincided with and reinforced their theology. Having been a student of the liberal arts himself, Augustine was well aware of the current teachings of philosophers and astronomers regarding the nature of the heavens. This led Augustine to question many of the cosmological claims made by the Manichees. The standard response to his questions was that Augustine must wait for Faustus, <laughs> a Manichaean bishop, in quotation marks, reputed to be extremely well informed in all branches of reputable scholarship and particularly learned in the liberal arts. This is how Augustine describes him in his confessions. Well, when Faustus arrived in 383, Augustine was deeply disappointed. He says the following, when, what I found was a man ill-educated in the liberal arts, apart from grammar, and even in that schooled, and even in that schooled only to an average level. So remember the three tiers of education? So this guy probably made it to like, you know, the high school level, the second level. When Augustine finally was able to pose his questions, Faustus refused, uh, courteously enough, reluctant to risk taking on the, the burden of his questions, for he knew that he did not know about these matters and was not ashamed to admit it. This is all Augustine's words. After his encounter with Faustus, Augustine lost all hope of finding the truth in the Manichaean religion. For a brief period, he entertained the possibility that he should resign himself to skepticism ever searching for the truth, but having no serious prospect of finding it. But then things changed. After briefly operating in his own school of grammar, rhetoric, and dialectic back in Carthage, I'm sorry, in Tagaste, in Tagaste uh, his hometown, and then returning to Carthage um, and finding considerable success as a teacher and practicer of rhetoric, Augustine decided in 383 to move to Rome in order to begin a new career teaching rhetoric. The principal reason for the move from his perspective was to teach students who were more docile and well-behaved than his students had been in Carthage. I always loved that. Uh, the fact that he said that his students were so rowdy, I can totally relate to that from my high school students. Augustine quickly found, however, that his hope for better students in Rome would not be realized. Although he was frustrated by this at the time, in retrospect, he saw God's deep secret providence, as well as his ever-present mercy at work. For in 384, he was summoned to Milan to serve as imperial rhetor. He also broke all ties with the Manichees at this time. And then he met uh, St. Ambrose of Milan, who he says this about. He was known throughout the world as one of the best men. And the following year, his mother Monica arrived in Milan. And then in 386, Augustine read the books of the Platonists, 
uh, who we would call the Neoplatonists, and began to understand how to interpret the Christian scriptures allegorically. Of all the aforementioned events, two stand out as particularly significant for Augustine's moral and intellectual formation. The first is the meeting with St. Ambrose and the lessons he learned from observing this saint's character and teachings. And the second is the reading of the books of the Neoplatonists and the intellectual conversion that these books precipitated. The life and teachings of St. Ambrose made a deep and lasting impression on Augustine, who saw their meeting as ordained by God to bring him to the church. Unknowingly, I was led by you, God, to him, Ambrose, so that through him I might be led knowingly to you. Indeed, to Augustine, Ambrose was a spiritual father, a man of God who welcomed Augustine with fatherly kindness and showed the charitable concern for his pilgrimage that befitted a bishop. These are his words again, St. Augustine's words. Initially, St. Augustine went only to hear the rhetoric of Ambrose's sermons. He had heard the man's eloquence and wanted to experience it for himself. When he first went to listen, he despised the message itself, having no real expectation of discovering truth in the Christian faith. Nevertheless, Augustine found himself moved by the content of Ambrose's sermons as well. As he says, as his words, which I enjoyed, penetrated my mind, the substance which I overlooked seeped in with them, for I could not separate the two. Ambrose's manifest virtue and remarkable discipline were humbling to Augustine, whereas Augustine had involved himself in the self-absorbed pursuit of his own worldly success, Ambrose had renounced the world and given himself unreservedly to serving his Christian flock. Whereas Augustine had used his eloquence to rise to a position of prominence and prestige in the imperial court, Ambrose had employed his eloquence to admonish the faithful and encourage them to lead holy lives. Finally, whereas Augustine had resolved so many years prior to follow the truth wherever it might lead, and yet had failed to follow through on his resolution. Ambrose had disciplined himself in the pursuit of truth through moral and intellectual virtue, embodying the love of truth that Augustine by now had all but abandoned. Beyond all this, Ambrose taught Augustine how to read the Bible with prudence and profit. Introducing St. Augustine to allegorical interpretation, Ambrose made clear to Augustine that not every passage and word of the Bible is meant to be interpreted literally. He says, I delighted to hear Ambro that Ambrose often asserting in his sermons to the people as a principle on which we must, he must insist emphatically, the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. This he would tell them as he drew aside the veil of mystery and opened to them the spiritual meaning of passages, which taken literally would seem to mislead. This principle of interpretation enabled Augustine to dispel the specious arguments of the Manichees against the theology and morality of the Old Testament. It also prepared him to understand more fully what it means for man to be made in the image and likeness of God. Another significant event during this period was Augustine's reading of the books of the Platonists, as I've said. While in Milan, Augustine was introduced to the writings of Plotinus, uh, a Neoplatonic philosopher born in Egypt, who later established a very successful school of philosophy in Rome. Plotinus reflected upon and developed many of the central teachings of Plato for his own generation. He would not have considered himself a Neoplatonist, simply a Platonist. Uh, and his student Porphyry, whose dates are from 232 to 303, then collected and organized Plotinus's writings into a whole called the Enneads. Augustine's reading of this work transformed his understanding of both the nature of God and the nature of evil. Regarding God, Augustine came to embrace the possibility of immaterial being. Having struggled for years to comprehend God as some sort of grand material being, Augustine followed the advice of the Neoplatonists to, quote, seek for truth beyond corporeal forms and to, quote, turn his gaze toward God's invisible reality, end quote. This is, uh, these quotes are from the Confessions again. This was a crucial step in Augustine's conversion to Christianity. 
as it helped him see that ultimately the best of rational philosophy and rightly understood Christian faith complement one another. The books of the Platonists also gave Augustine a new understanding of evil. For Plotinus, all that exists is good. Therefore, evil must be a privation of the good. In other words, there is no principle of evil, no substance of evil, as the Manichaeans had taught. Instead, evil is a lack of something, um, a lack of some sort in a being that is by nature good. The, it, the best way to understand this, of course, is with cold. Uh, does cold exist? Well, no, you can't measure cold. You can only measure heat, right? Cold is simply a lack of heat. It doesn't have any positive being in and of itself. Uh, likewise, darkness. Does darkness exist? Well, no. It, light exists. You can measure light. But darkness is simply an absence of light, okay? So the implication of this view of evil, that it is a lack of goodness, were tremendous for Augustine, leading in time to his confession that the evils of his past and present thoughts, words, and deeds were his own responsibility, they were for his own lack inside of himself. Since much of Augustine's life followed his conversion, um, the following his conversion um, uh, is really, the, you know, that's the substance of what I'm going to be talking about uh, right now. Uh, I just want to give a very, very brief uh, treatment of, um, of some things that led up to it. Following his encounter with the books of the Platonists in the early winter of 386, Augustine had his famous conversion experience in the Garden of Milan and resigned from his position as professor of rhetoric. He then retired to a villa in Casicciacum, which is north of Milan, with his mother, his son, Adeodatus, and a few friends in order to prepare for baptism. Their retreat lasted from November 386 through March 387, and Augustine based his Casicciacum dialogues upon their conversations during this time. Augustine and the other catechumens were baptized by St. Ambrose at the Easter Vigil on April 24th, 387. Later that spring, Monica died in Ostia shortly after sharing a mystical vision with Augustine as they overlooked a garden. In 388, Augustine returned to Tagaste with his son, Adeodatus, to found a monastic community there dedicated to prayer, study, and labor. Augustine's attempt at living a monastic life was cut short, though, when in 391 he was ordained as priest for the Diocese of Hippo Regis, which is in North Africa. Uh, he was ordained by Bishop Valerius. Four years later, he was consecrated as an auxiliary bishop alongside Valerius, who died shortly thereafter. Augustus remained Bishop of Hippo Regis uh, until his death in 430. And in 428, Augustine sat down with his faithful secretary and friend Posidius and composed a document known as, in Latin as the Retractationes, or revisions in English, which chronicles and summarizes all of Augustine's written works and occasionally offers additional comments or corrections. In 429, Geyseric and his Vandal army descended through the Straits of Gibraltar into North Africa and uh, arrived on the outskirts of Hippo the following year to lay siege to the city. Perhaps due to the intercession of Augustine, the town of Hippo was spared, complete destruction, and Augustine's library survived essentially intact. Augustine contracted a high fever, however, likely due to malaria, and died in the bishop's residence on August 28th of 430. In the concluding chapter of his life of St. Augustine, Basidius makes the following comments about the man with whom he had lived and ministered, quote, on terms of intimate and delightful friendship with no bitter disagreement for almost 40 years. He said, from his writing, it is manifest that this priest, beloved and acceptable to God, lived uprightly and soberly in the faith, hope and love of the universal church, insofar as he was permitted to see by the light of truth and those who read his works on divine subjects profit thereby. But I believe that they were able to derive greater good from him <clears throat> who heard and saw him as he spoke in person in the church, and especially those who knew him well and knew his manner of life among men. Contemporary biographies of Augustine abound to, uh, nowadays. 
for all their merits, these accounts typically shy away from presenting the genuine virtues of this great man. Basidius, on the other hand, a man who knew Augustine intimately, had the courage and humility to, to bear testimony to Augustine's character. A teacher among teachers, Augustine's life embodied the truths he taught in his writings. And although we do not have the privilege of knowing Augustine personally, as Posidius did, we nevertheless can search Augustine's writings in order to discern his philosophy and theology of education and to follow his example of living uprightly and soberly in faith, hope, and love. <clears throat> now I would like to speak about a little bit about Augustine's world. Uh, and put him in some, some historical and intellectual context. Any age of human history is at odds with itself in significant ways. Various trends of thought and action pull in different directions, challenging the status quo and putting strain on any existing economic, political, and ideological stability. Even with these challenges, there is typically enough continuity for the age to persist in a way that is discernible from the historian's point of view. On other occasions, however, the tensions between the old ways and the new come to a point of crisis, bringing about a fundamental change in the established order. We can feel this intimately in our own society. In the Roman world of late antiquity, the world of Augustine was a time of widespread and momentous transition, <clears throat> a period when the old order of pagan antiquity was giving way to what would eventually become medieval Christendom and the new unity of Europe. And as I mentioned before, Augustine's own family really embodied this tension and this transition given his father's Roman paganism and his mother's commitment to Christianity. Well, before we proceed any further, we just need to note how, how very Roman the North Africa of Augustine's lifetime really was. Uh, there have been scholars in recent years who have made a great deal, uh, too much it would seem, of Augustine as an African, and this view fails to account for the profound way Roman civilization had taken root throughout the empire, including in the Roman provinces of Africa. In some ways it was a backwater, in some ways it was the heartland. And as Ryan Topping puts it, by Augustine's time, Roman North Africa had enjoyed the benefits of empire for several hundred years united in prosperity and by culture in a significant way in the fourth century, Rome was Athens, was Carthage. Educated people read the same books, they shared the same philosophical ideas, and they were awarded similar privileges. Augustine's African birth did not separate him from Greco-Roman civilization. He was steeped in the common rhetorical and philosophical tradition of Latin antiquity. <laughs> but looked back upon, uh, among others, to Cicero, to Virgil, and to Varro. By the time of his birth, Augustine's family had been Roman for a century and a half. Notwithstanding his mother Monica's purported Berber origins, Augustine was a Roman of Roman stock. He received a liberal education grounded in the greatest Roman authors. And even in his native North Africa, he lived in a world that had been dominated by Roman ways of life for generations. Before his conversion to Christianity, Augustine thought like a Roman, taught like a Roman, and engaged in social and political life like any typical Roman man would have done. Furthermore, after his conversion, Augustine did not simply repudiate his Roman past. Evidence of his indebtedness to his Greco-Roman education is abundantly present in Augustine's post conversion writings, especially the, the, uh, the first ones, uh, the early ones, that is the Kasichiacum dialogues. His more mature works likewise bear the marks of his reliance upon and response to the greatest of his Roman teachers, Cicero, of course, also with Virgil and Varro. In these later works, Augustine does not so much renounce his Roman heritage as transform it in light of the Christian gospel. And if we return to the general topic of the tension between the established ways of pagan Rome and the new beliefs of Christianity, a few significant events help us to more fully understand Augustine and his world. Beginning with Christ and his 12 apostles who were sent out as the first Christian missionaries in the middle of the first century AD, the Christian faith steadily grew in numbers as well as in political strength throughout the Roman world. 
Current estimates indicate that by the year 250, there were approximately 1 million Christians living in the empire. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier tonight, contrary to longstanding legend, Christianity was not principally a movement of the downtrodden, a religion for Roman slaves and the impoverished rural masses. Instead, the Christian faith took root and grew most rapidly in major metropolitan areas, and it was particularly successful among the middle and upper classes, which consisted largely of established and often influential Roman citizens. The new religion was so successful, in fact, that by 300, that is the year 300, the number of Christians in the empire had swelled to roughly 6 million. Not surprisingly, this upstart religion from Palestine came to be perceived by many traditionally minded Romans as a threat to the established political order. Although there had been intermittent periods of persecution since the founding of Christianity, the great persecution of 303 was the last and most severe in antiquity. Instigated by the Roman Emperor Diocletian, it was a widespread and systematic attempt to exterminate Christians entirely. Often on pain of death, Christians were ordered to renounce their faith and comply with the traditional practices of Roman civic religion. As a sign of their submission to the persecutors' demands, priests and bishops were required to hand over their copies of the scriptures, sacred vessels used in the celebration of the Eucharist, and uh, to give names of other Christians who had not obeyed the imperial edicts. Those who refused to do so were imprisoned or in some cases tortured and martyred. The period of persecution was most acute from 303 to 305. And when the Emperor Constantine took imperial office in 306, he elevated the suffering of Christians, I'm sorry, he alleviated the suffering of Christians and began to dismantle the apparatus of state-imposed persecution. The period of persecution officially ended in the year 313 AD with the Edict of Milan, which formally restored legal status to Christians and to the extent possible, restore their confiscated properties. Well, as welcome as the end of the great persecution no doubt was, it also presented difficult questions for the Christians who had survived it. What would become of the character of Christianity now that fierce opposition from Rome had been removed? Given that religious freedom had been granted, how should Christians think about the relation of their faith to the current political order, or to any political order for that matter? Any difficult, oh, no, sorry, another difficult question centered on what should be done about those <clears throat> who had capitulated to the demands of their persecutors. Priests and bishops who had given in to the persecution came to be known as traditores, that is, those who had handed over the scriptures, the sacred vessels, and the names of fellow believers. Could the traditores ever be trusted again? Even more pointedly, had they forfeited their right to serve as priests and bishops by publicly renouncing the Christian faith under pressure? Well, in the course of his life, St. Augustine responded to each of these questions. and will address his thoughts on the relation of the church, relationship of the church to secular political power uh, later on when we discuss his city of God. But for now, let us focus on the more particular questions about the traditores. Throughout Augustine's life, Christians in North Africa were sharply divided over how to respond to these questions. On the one hand were the Donatists, named after Donatus, one of the first bishops of the separatist group. And these held that anyone who had lapsed during the persecution was ipso facto cut off from the church. Simply by virtue of the fact that these clerics had become traditores, both their baptisms and their ordinations were deemed automatically annulled. Donatists believed that there was a necessary connection between the virtue of a clergyman and the validity of the sacraments he administered. Put simply, bad men could not administer valid sacraments. Uh, now, the position of the church, on the other hand, denied this necessary connection between the virtue of the clergyman and the validity of the sacraments. To them, to, the, to the, those in the, to the church, the efficacy of a sacrament was completely and exclusively secured through the finished work of Christ, ex opere operato, that is, out of the work already worked, um, when, uh, uh, when the Holy Spirit is granted unto that clergyman at the moment of ordination. Thus, while an ordained priest or bishop is the divinely appointed means of administering the sacrament, his personal sanctity or lack thereof has no bearing whatsoever 
on the efficacy of the sacrament, provided that it is administered in the way that it has been handed down from the apostles who received it from Christ himself. Tensions between Donatists and those in the uh, uh, the Church Catholic in North Africa were common and at times very fierce. As an ordained bishop, Augustine took part in a major council in Carthage in 411 to respond to the conflict, and he defended the Catholic position. He uh, debated this issue with a Donatist opponent before the assembled council. And although the imperial magistrate at the council ruled in favor of the universal church and its practice that I've just outlined, its beliefs that I've just outlined, the Donatists continued to be an antagonistic presence in North Africa, really until the Muslim, inv Muslim invasion of the 8th century, when they were all wiped out. And that was the only when the, finally the last remnants of Donatism were, were swept away. Augustine's efforts in speaking and writing against the Donatists, though, are an illustrative example of how he responded to the tensions and transitions of his time. Having grown up in a world in which traditional Roman pagans were at odds with Christians and Christians themselves were in conflict with one another, Augustine faithfully served as a teacher and ecclesial leader. Throughout his life as bishop, he responded in a timely and effective manner to challenges from within the Christian faith as well as from outside forces. Influenced by the historical, political, and ecclesial realities of his time, he influenced them in turn, bringing clear-headed reasoning and prudent action to bear upon the problems of his age. And in addition to the, this historical context of Augustine's worlds, we should also consider his intellectual context. Um, in this regard, I want to outline two distinct branches within the Western tradition of education. What have come to be called the rhetorical tradition, the orators, and on the other hand, the philosophical tradition, the philosophers. And then I want to draw attention to what was undoubtedly the greatest influence on Augustine's thinking in the years leading up to and following his conversion, and that is the Bible itself. Well, to the first point, essentially two distinct schools of thought on the nature and purpose of education had developed in the Western tradition before, long before Augustine. On the one hand, there was the rhetorical tradition, championed by, say, the Sophists and by Soc uh, Isocrates, in, whose dates are 436 to 338 BC, and his disciples throughout the ages, which focus on the cultivation of the art of rhetoric and the public performance of this art. For the orator, education's ultimate goal is to prepare students to take their place as productive, responsible members of society who are able to engage in public discourse to take an active part in political deliberation, and to contribute thereby to the good of the regime. The philosophical tradition, on the other hand, championed by Socrates and Plato and their disciples, principally employs dialectic and is ordered to the discovery of truth. For the philosopher, the unfettered pursuit of truth is the ultimate purpose of education. There is a strong emphasis here in this tradition on knowledge for its own sake, while the distinction between the rhetorical and philosophical traditions can be overstated, there are nonetheless distinct approaches to education within the Western tradition, approaches that avail themselves of different texts and different pedagogies in order to educate their students. Augustine's early training in grammar and rhetoric was decidedly within the rhetorical tradition. His reading of Cicero and other authors of rhetorical treatises, as well as the speaking exercises and contests he describes in Confessions, are clear evidence of this. Nevertheless, Augustine's intellectual journey was, I'm sorry, as recounted in his Confessions, bears testimony to the fact that as he developed intellectually, he became more and more committed to the philosophical tradition. Abundant evidence of this comes to light when we discuss some of his works uh, in detail, uh, which I'm going to do later on, for the moment, though, it is sufficient to know about these two different branches and to realize that his own philosophy and theology uh, became less indebted to the rhetorical tradition as he matured. Finally, we must remind ourselves of what is obvious to uh, anyone with prior exposure to Augustine's life and writings, namely that throughout the more than four decades after his conversion, during which Augustine taught and wrote, the Bible was far and wide the most uh, significant influence on his philosophy and theology of education. His encounters with sacred scripture over the years had a profound and enduring influence 
on the way he thought as well as on the way he taught. Philosophy itself had to be reconsidered in the light of the truths of the Christian faith. And for this reason alone, any attempt to give an account of Augustine's philosophy of education without taking into consideration his theology of education is doomed to failure. So let's try to now explore the nature and purpose of education as uh, Augustine articulates it. Augustine's account of the ultimate purpose of education falls within the eudaimonist tradition uh, of Aristotle. That is to say, for Augustine, the final goal of all teaching and learning is happiness, or a better translation of eudaimonia, you remember, is human flourishing. The Latin here would be beatitudo, a state of being that is inherently desirable and that amounts to the perfection of human nature achieved through the practice of moral and intellectual virtue. So Plato, Aristotle, the Epicureans, the Stoics, all defended versions of eudaimonism. And in our day, uh, the one who, which has come down that is the most quickly associated with this is that of Aristotle. This is what he has to say. Uh, Aristotle in his Nicomachean Ethics, uh, book one, section seven through eight, says that happiness satisfies the conditions for the highest good for man. Number one, um, he says, eudaimonia is an, one and ultimate end. It is most choice, choice worthy, that is chosen always and only for itself and never for the sake of something else. Two, it is complete and comprehensive, including the virtues as intrinsic goods and external goods insofar as they ensure uh, three, its self-sufficiency, namely the inclusion of all things that are good for human beings, especially those over which we have control, for example, virtue. Four, it cannot be increased by the addition of any other good. And five, it is most pleasant in and of itself. So this is the idea of human flourishing, eudaimonia. In order to better understand the distinctive character of Augustine's eudaimonism, we would do well to note a few general characteristics common to all eudaimonist theories, as well as a few specific characteristics that distinguish one such theory from another. Generally speaking, all eudaimonist theories have at least three common elements. First, unlike many other modern theories of ethics and educational philosophy, eudaimonist accounts are unabashedly grounded in the conviction that human nature is both stable and knowable. It is neither in constant flux nor beyond our grasp as intellectual beings to understand. And by means of rational inquiry, we can come to know human nature not only as it currently does exist, but also as it could exist in a state of perfection. Secondly, we can rationally discern how to get from where we currently are to where we aspire to be. This general approach to ethics and education proceeds from ends to principles to means. Having identified what the ultimate end of man is, the eudaimonist contends we may proceed from first principles to the means of arriving at perfection. Lastly, the third common feature of eudaimonist accounts is that the practice of the virtues or the moral and intellectual excellencies of the human soul is the central means by which we may approach perfection. Now, with all of those things you know, uh, said, and with all that in mind, we might also note the kinds of differences that distinguish one eudaimonist account from another. First, there are differences in the understanding of what happiness consists of. Does it involve the body, the soul, or both? Is the happiness in question only what may be attained in this life, or is the happiness of our earthly existence uh, but an imperfect foretaste of the full and perfect happiness found in the life hereafter? Second, there are significant differences from one eudaimonist theory to another, regarding what the virtues are, how they are to be defined, and what, if any, order exists among them. Finally, there are also key differences regarding where we begin. In other words, what exactly is man's condition on this side of perfection? What accounts for our current condition? Is our attempt to exercise moral and intellectual virtue enough? Apart from external aid, can man, through his own efforts, attain perfection? Augustine's account of happiness and his understanding of the ultimate purpose of education are best understood against this broad backdrop.
For from the time of the Cassiciacum Dialogues, the earliest of, ex, uh, of Augustine's extant writings, Augustine makes an account of happiness or beatitudo, beatitude, central to his philosophy of education, connecting the final end of human life to the ultimate goal of teaching and learning. Significantly, these four dialogues together dramatize what has been described as a pedagogy in action. We read in Topping again, through the Contra Academicos, Augustine draws attention to the process of the discovery of truth. In the De Beata Vita, we see unfolded the quest for the happy life. In the De Ordine is uncovered the proper order of learning. Through the Soliloquia, we learn the right method for gaining knowledge of God and the soul. First, let's take a look at De Beata Vita, or on the blessed life, on the happy life in order to see the beginnings of Augustine's account of happiness. We might note in passing also that Seneca has a, uh, an essay with the exact same title. So again, there's, he's already, Augustine is already kind of positioning himself within that kind of Greco-Roman philosophical tradition. And from here, we can consider the Cassiciacum dialogues in general to see what they reveal about Augustine's early philosophy of education. And then we can discuss the development of Augustine's account of happiness and uh, as is found in his later works. And what we'll find is a natural unfolding, really, that shows how Augustine's concept of happiness and its attainment was progressively enriched through his ever deeper understanding of his philosophical and theological sources. Composed during the autumn of 386, De Beata Vita, On the Happy Life, sheds light upon Augustine's early understanding of happiness. As he awaits baptism and reception into the church, Augustine is always firmly convinced that the only way to be truly happy is to enjoy God. The entire philosophical quest for truth is ordered to this end. After his, uh, I'm sorry, after the interlocutors in the dialogue establish that everyone wants to be happy, they begin to consider what constitutes happiness. While having what one wants is often considered essential for happiness, it is clearly not sufficient. As Augustine's mother, Monica, points out, quote, if a man wants and has good things, he is happy, but if he wants bad things, even if he has them, he is unhappy, end quote. At this point, the interlocutors decide to, to consider, quote, what we should want and what things we ought to desire in order to be happy, end quote. They quickly agree that whatever it is, it has to be something that lasts forever and isn't dependent upon good luck or subject to misfortune. And soon after, they agree that whosoever has God is happy. The conversation then turns to examine exactly who it is that has God. As Augustine leads the discussion, the interlocutors make headway in their pursuit of this question and those that follow from it. And eventually, on the third day of their conversation, the question under consideration is, what is wisdom? Responding to this question finally brings resolution to their earlier question regarding who has God. We read, what should we call wisdom, if not that wisdom which is God's? We have it on the authority of God himself that the Son of God is God's wisdom, and the Son of God surely is God. But what do you think wisdom is, if not truth? For scripture also says, I am the truth, Whoever shall have come to the highest limit through the truth is happy. For minds to have God is precisely this, to enjoy God. That then is full satiety of minds, namely the happy life, to know piously and perfectly that by which you are led into the truth, that truth which you enjoy, and that through which you are joined to the highest limit. There are three things we should note about these conclusions. First, we see that at this point in his reflections on the happy life, Augustine presents having God as the mind's attainment of wisdom, which in turn is truth. At first glance, this could sound like a fairly intellectualist account of happiness. The, the attainment of the happy life is described in terms of the full satiety of minds. However, secondly, we must also immediately note that such knowledge, though presented as the satisfaction of the mind, is nevertheless a knowledge of and through the person of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. In some sense, then, the happy life is conceived as a union with God himself, mystically, 
Finally, we sh should attend to the fact that even in these early writings, Augustine has a place for authority in his philosophical pursuit of the truth. The dialogue reaches its highest conclusion only by recourse to sacred scripture. And as Augustine puts it, quote, we have it on the authority of God himself, end quote. Moreover, as the dialogue is advancing towards its conclusion, Augustine makes repeated reference or allusion to a divine source that enables him to discern the truth of what is said. Beyond his reliance upon the authority of the Bible, then, there is a more fundamental reliance upon God himself teaching Augustine inwardly. We will return to the, this place of authority and especially to the doctrine of Christ as inner teacher later. Uh, but for now, it is sufficient to note that from his earliest extant writings, Augustine is committed both to reason and to authority, or as medieval thinkers would later frame it, to both faith and reason. These are both legitimate and indeed both crucial sources of truth in the pursuit of wisdom for Augustine. And before we discuss the developments of Augustine's understanding of happiness and the happy life in his later writings, we would do well to get a fuller sense of what the Kasichiacum dialogues in general teach us about Augustine's early philosophy of education. We recall from the second chapter the distinct uh, um, uh, schools of thought in the West on the nature and purpose of education, the orators and the philosophers that I've mentioned before, that is the rhetorical tradition and the philosophical tradition. To be sure, we find in these dialogues the influence of the rhetorical tradition and uh, in which Augustine was trained as a young man. With the exception of Monica and Augustine's cousins, Lartidianus and Rusticus, all those present at the Cassiciacum dialogues had received a traditional Roman education in grammar and rhetoric, including training and reading of classical literary texts, such as Virgil and Cicero, and of course, uh, argumentation and dialectic. The dramatic action of these dialogues is in important ways informed by the texts and pedagogical methods of the rhetorical tradition. In another one of these dialogues, for example, the Contra Academicos, the interlocutors take nearly seven days off to read and discuss certain books of Virgil's Aeneid. In serving the, as the leader of these discussions, it, it may be that Augustine intends to depict himself sort of in the role of a Roman grammaticus, a teacher whose duties uh, would have included commenting on classical texts. Moreover, some scholars see in Augustine's long speech against Cicero in against the uh, academics, contra academicos, a model declamation delivered by an orator. Even granting all of this, however, the education that Augustine conducted at Cassiciacum was more of a school of philosophy than a school of rhetoric. First and most obviously, Augustine chose to, be, to present these works as dialogues, uh, the literary form most closely associated with Plato and the subsequent philosophical tradition. More importantly, in these works, the literary form is no mere window dressing, but a poetic representation of Augustine's commitment to dialectic as the principal means of pursuing truth. This fact becomes clear when we reflect upon the structure and content of the Cassiciacum dialogues taken as a literary and philosophical whole. In the first dialogue against the academics, contra academicos, um, August, by which he means the skeptics, that's really the skeptics of, the, of Plato's academy. Augustine and his friends establish truth as the worthy and attainable goal of the philosophical way of life. Like any good philosopher, Augustine begins by dispelling the doubts of skepticism and engendering confidence in his companions that the truth can be known. For Augustine, the philosophical life begins with an act of hope. Then following in the footsteps of Cicero in his Hortensius, Augustine composes his own exhortation to the life of philosophy in his De, Be Be De Beata Vita on the happy life. Once happiness has been firmly established as the destination of the journey, Augustine proceeds in De Ordine on order to unfold the proper order of learning, that is the roadmap that will lead Augustine and his companions to their journey's end. And finally, in the soliloquies, a term actually coined by Augustine himself, he engages in a dialogic monologue, as it were, between himself and reason in order to demonstrate the correct method of acquiring knowledge of God and the soul. 
If you take it all together, then, these four dialogues embody Augustine's early understanding of the nature of education in theory as well as practice. In terms of manner, Topping contends, Augustine's Cassiciacum dialogues present a living model for education. And as another scholar, Hado, has argued, ancient philosophy did not only concern itself with theory, schools also represented an alternative and superior way of life. Practical and intellectual disciplines were cultivated with this aim in sight. And while Augustine is clearly and deeply indebted to the philosophical tradition as a way of life that he champions, uh, uh, it is in certain significant respects quite different from earlier philosophies. Um, first of all, as he, uh, uh, as I've already pointed out, Augustine affords an enduring and central place to authority in his pursuit of truth. This difference sets Augustine's theory and practice of education apart from really all of his predecessors. A second difference, and closely related to this first one, is that while dialectic is the principal model of inquiry and reason, um, uh, and reason is given relatively free reign in these dialogues. Such rational dialectic, <clears throat> insofar as it adequately attains the truth at all, could never in principle contradict the authority of either Christ, the incarnate word, or the Bible, the written word of God, revealed to mankind. A pioneer, really, of the integration of faith and reason, Augustine is confident that a proper understanding of the revealed truths of Christianity and the results of philosophical inquiry properly conducted can never ultimately be in conflict. Finally, Augustine carries out his philosophical inquiry in the acknowledged presence of God, regularly imploring God's assistance and thus making prayer an integral part of the philosophical pursuit of truth. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Augustine, for Augustine, there is no philosophy of education without a theology of education. At the very end of On the Happy Life, Monica offers a prayer to the Trinity and then sums up her feelings, quote, this is without doubt the happy life, and that life is perfect toward which we can, we must presume, be quickly brought through solid faith, lively hope, and burning love. Significantly, it is through the, the theological virtues, which are excellencies of the soul infused by God's gifts, that we are brought to perfect happiness. Augustine concurs with Monica, offering a prayer of thanks to the highest and true God, the Father, to the Lord, the deliverer of souls. <laughs>